Hi everyone, uh, welcome. I hope you had a good lunch. Uh, my name is Dina. I work for Riverbed on an uh, application performance monitoring product. But today I'm actually going to talk to you about something based on the work I did about four years ago, and that's automating crash analysis. So first, I'm going to try to give you some motivation about why you even need to automate crash analysis. And then we're going to dive into the details. Uh, we're going to look at the tools which are available for us, both for manual analysis and for automation. And since we're in the .NET Core era now, we're going to repeat all of our demos and overviews twice, once for Windows and once for Linux. Now, I do have to admit that I don't work with .NET Core uh, daily or at all, nor with Linux. And so this work is based mostly on my desktop.NET experience. However, you will see that the tools and concepts apply no matter which uh, platform you're working with. Okay, so as I said, we'll start with some motivation. Production is special. Ideally, we'd have a stage and environment in which we could simulate production under the exact same conditions as in real life. But that is rarely the case. And it's not because we don't test correctly or we don't invest enough uh, time and resources into it, but simply because some things only happen in production. If you're developing a client-side application, then you can't control where your application is going to be installed. You don't know the exact operating system version. You don't know which service packs are going to be installed. You don't know what the locale is going to be. You don't know anything about any configurations and that might be networking, permissions, maybe some security products getting in your way. If you develop a web server or just a server, you actually can control your environment, but still, Real life data and, and load patterns are different than what you might encounter in real life. And we all know that users tend to do weird stuff with our systems. And even if your simulation is absolutely perfect, still, when your system is up for days, weeks, months, years, if you're lucky enough, then Rare cosmic events tend to happen and cause unforeseen behavior. So this is the premise of this talk. It all happened, as I said, about four years ago. We were starting to work on a system in a very tight schedule, and we didn't have much manpower. So we ended up deploying it to production without much testing. As you might expect, the results were not so good. Um, what happened actually is that we deployed the system to about 10 machines, and on each of them, the system would crash several times a day. And that means we had dozens of crashes every day. So the first thing we did was register on the unhandled exception event display a generic error message to the user, and nicely shut down the application, like not to show that we have an ugly crash. And of course, we wrote uh, down this exception to the log files, and in fact, we had lots of logs throughout the entire system. And sometimes it helped. Some of the bugs we were able to reproduce and fix. However, it wasn't always enough. And the reason for this was that our system actually contained both managed and native code. And most of the problems were in the native part. So these exceptions weren't even caught by the CLR. And by the way, that means that we still had ugly crashes of the application. So we didn't have uh, the log of the exception that occurred. 
And still, although we had lots of other logs, as I said, still this wasn't always enough to know what exactly was the last thing that the system was doing before it crashed. And still, even in cases where the exception, the crash, was caused by managed code, and we had the error message in the log file, sometimes this is not enough. Because, for example, if you get a keynote found exception, then this exception just doesn't contain the information about the key which was not found. So, what's the conclusion from all of this? If we want to be able to handle, to fix all of the crashes that we have, we need exact information about the exception that happened, we need to know where in the code it happened, when it happened, and what was going on around the system when it happened. Luckily for us, and that's why we're here of course, there's an answer to all of this, and these are dump files. A dump file is basically a file which contains the entire memory space of a process. Anything that's in the memory of the process is contained in that file. And that means that we have threads, their local variables, function arguments, global variables, we have all of the data structures that were allocated on the heap. We have uh, exceptions, managed exception, native exceptions. We have information about locks, about what threads are waiting for. Now these files are written in standard for, uh, way, and there are various tools that can open them and allow us to kind of traverse the memory and wander around what's going on in the process. I do have to mention, though, that the standard is different between Windows and Linux. And that means that if you have a Linux dump, you can't open it on Windows and vice versa. But still, on each platform, we have freely available tools. So, to finish off this motivational talk, let's just see what's available for us inside a dump. Unfortunately, because we don't have a lot of time and I have lots of stuff that I want to tell you today, I won't do all of the demos live. I pre-recorded some of them, so let's start. What we're going to see now is a, uh, an opening, a dump file, which I created earlier uh, of a certain application which crashed on my machine. We're going to open it with Visual Studio and see what we can find out. So already as we open it, we see all sorts of useful information. The architecture, exception code, OS version, CLR version. If I want to dig deeper and watch the memory, I will click on debug. And straight as the opens, opens, Visual Studio shows me the exception and where exactly it happened. And I can see, for example, here the local variables inside the code and other local variables which I don't see right now. So really, this is just a tiny example. I assume that most of you work with Visual Studio daily, so I'm not going to get into too much details here. Just some motivation. Good. So, I hope now we're convinced the dumps are going to give us everything we need in order to be able to solve our uh, mysterious crashes. So, let's talk about how we can obtain such magical files. So, there are two main scenarios where you might want to take a dump. The first is a dump of a crashing application. Just like we saw, if you want to analyze the crash, you will need a dump of the process of the moment right before it crashed. The second scenario is taking a dump of a running process. Why might it be useful? For example, maybe your process is stuck and you don't know what's keeping it from working correctly. So you take a dump 
which allows you to see what's going on inside the process and understand why it suddenly stopped. Or for example, maybe suddenly your process is consuming a large amount of memory. And so you want to see what are these objects that are taking up all the space. So you get a dump, you look inside, you see what's allocated, and this might help you figure out the problem. Or maybe if you have a memory leak, if you notice that suddenly your process is starting to grow and grow and grow in memory, you might want to take several snapshots, several dumps, and compare them. What is the specific type that was allocated between two snapshots? This might lead us to the origin of the leak. Or, for example, if you have suddenly too many threads, you take it, um, you see what they're doing, and maybe you can find out why it is that so many of them got created. In a moment, we're going to see tools, both Windows and Linux, which will allow us to get these dumps in all of these scenarios. So let's start with Windows. The first thing that I want to show you, oops, excuse me, this, is how to obtain a crash dump on Windows. It's actually very easy. You simply need to configure something in registry. Um, there's a mechanism in Windows called Windows Error Reporting, WHERE for short, and you can find it in the registry under local machines, software, Microsoft, Windows, Windows Error Reporting. And there, under the local dumps, you can configure some stuff. For example, you can write the dump folder, which is the folder where any crash dump would be saved. You can configure the dump type. Two, in this case, means it's a full dump. It means that actually the entire uh, memory space is going to get written. And you can also configure the dump count, the maximum number of dumps that you're going to save. And it's important because dumps, since they contain the entire memory, they tend to be quite large files. So you don't want suddenly losing all your disk space for dump files. You can also customize this configuration for specific uh, processes. So for example, maybe I'd like to limit console crasher just to two dumps. So let's see that in action. Here is my dump folder, and here is my console crasher. I'm going to run it, and I'm going to make it crash, and there you go, we have the dump file. In fact, this is the way I created the dump file which we previously opened in Visual Studio. The next thing I want to show you is how to get a dump of a running process still on Windows. So we're going to watch a video of that. So for the purpose of this demo, I wrote a web server using .NET Core. Um, so let's start it. It's running. I will connect to the website. It's a cat server and we'll try to register. So obviously I aided it out all the waiting, uh, but believe me, it's stuck. We saw that the server got our request, but I waited and waited and waited and nothing happened. So that's the time obviously to get a dump and check what's going on under the hood. So, I think I skipped something, excuse me. <laughs> okay, so for this purpose, we're going to use a tool called Proc Dump, which is available online along with the sysinternal suite. And this tool, as you will see in a moment, it has quite a lot of uh, options, actually. We won't go over them, obviously. Uh, you can control the type, you can control the process, you can control, give it certain triggers, like if it passes a certain CPU threshold. Uh, but in our case, we're only interested 
and manually taking a dump of our process. So I just need to obtain the process ID, which I'll easily do, do using Task Manager. I'll find the specific .NET process that I need, and now that I have it, I simply call proc dump minus AMA, it means it's a full memory dump, my process ID, the output directory, and there you go, we have our dump. Let's open it in Visual Studio again and see what's going on. So I'm gonna go straight for uh, debugging it because I'm not interested in all of the metadata that is around. And you will see this is not a crash dump, so we don't get this pop-up with an exception because there was no exception. Uh, what I do want to know is why it stopped working, so I want to look at my process's threads. And I think it's going to be pretty easy to do that using the parallel stacks window in Visual Studio, uh, which will soon open in my recording. I should have edited that out. Okay, good. We're opening parallel stacks so that I can watch what our threads are doing. There you go, now we can easily find our threads. Here's the first one. I'll double click it, and I can see that it's waiting for a lock, and notice that it acquired a different lock before, just before that. Now I'll go to another one of my threads, and I'll see that it's waiting for a lock, and just like before, it acquired a different log before, and if we look a little better, we will see that they're actually the same logs, but in reverse order. So obviously, we have a deadlock. And all of that was available to us looking inside the dump. The last thing on Windows that I want to show you is a tool called Debug Diag. Um, it provides a very convenient UI for configuring all sorts of dump taking scenarios. Uh, so it supports both crashes and exceptions and performance investigation. For example, you can configure it to take a dump whenever a certain exception occurs in your application, whether it's managed or native. You can configure it to take a dump whenever a certain event happens in your application, for example, when a thread is created. You can configure it to take a, to monitor, excuse me, a certain performance counter, for example, memory, and a dump on a certain trigger. For example, if your process exceeded a certain amount of memory for a certain amount of time. And it even has a special UI for analyzing slow IIS exception. So it's really easy to work with it. Now, let's see how we can do the same things on Linux. So the first thing I'm going to show you is how to get crash dumps. So let's look at this script here now. This doesn't have uh, a really uh, direct connection to taking dumps, but for example, if we might face an out of memory problem, then we must make sure that our application is actually going to crash. So we need to disallow over commit so that our application actually crashes. Again, this is a Linux uh, thing. Now we actually get to the point, to the uh, taking the crash dump. As always in Linux, we need to write something somewhere, and this is the Linux version of configuring the registry. Um, basically, what's written here 
is that whenever an application crashes, the system is going to create a file, a core file, that's how our crash dumps called in Linux, and this file is going to be saved next to our executable. So I call it the Linux Windows error reporting. We're going to run these two scripts. And the last thing we're going to do is, again, because we might be dealing with quite large files, we want to uh, allow the system to save any file size. So we also need to tell it to make the size unlimited. And now we can finally get to taking a dump. So let's start our web server. It's the exact web server that we saw in the Windows version. And you can see that currently there is no core file in my directory. So I ran the server and we'll open our cat site again. But this time we're going to go to a different page, a page which actually crashes. That's the login page. So I'll go to the login page and I will look at the server and I see that it crashed. Now let's look in our directory and we see our core file. So of course the time and date is not from today, but believe me that it just appeared there. Now let's look at how we can take live process dumps. So we run our server again, and this time, I'll repeat the sequence for, for getting the server to hang. Uh, this time, we're going to use the um, proc dump equivalent on Linux. It's called G-Core. It's less fancy. It doesn't have all the uh, arguments that uh, proc dump has. But it still allows us to simply get a dump of a running process. So my server is running, so I will need to create another uh, connection to my virtual machine. And just like in the Windows case, I will need to get the process ID for the process that I'm interested in. So that's the second one here. And once I have that, I am all set, and I can take a dump using G-Core for my process. Good. So the file is there, and later on, we'll see how to analyze it. Now, just a tiny note, I am not aware of a debug Diag version for Linux, but in the spirit of Linux, it shouldn't be too hard to write a script which monitors, say, memory, and then manually takes a dump whenever a certain threshold uh, exceeds, and using more uh, sophisticated tools, more advanced tools, such as trace points, you might even uh, create setups such as taking dumps whenever a thread opens, for example. Good. So now that we've put our hands on some dump files, we need to analyze them. But before we can automate the process, we need to learn how to do it manually, of course, so that we know what to automate. So I think that on Windows, the easiest way to analyze dumps is using debug diag except uh, for its fancy dump taking capabilities, it can also do some basic analysis. So for example, here you can clearly see the invalid operation exception, which is the exception we had in our console crasher. And this is a screenshot because it's less interesting, but if you scroll down, you will also see all the call stacks for the threads and the application. But that's really less interesting. Let's do something better. WinDebug is a full debugger 
which allows you debugging both native and managed. It allows you to see call stacks. It allows you to see uh, operating system structures, uh, locks, critical sections, whatnot. And we can use it to analyze our dump. So let's go back to my windows. And I already have WinDebug open here uh, with a dump file. And I will call a very simple uh, command. Analyze minus V for verbose. And that was quick. If I scroll a little up, I will see that I had a null reference exception, and I even have the call stack of my crash. This is a WinForms application, somewhere in the main form, something with a tree view, whatever. Obviously, I can now go back to my code and do whatever needs to be done. Now, WinDebug supports extensions. Basically, these are just DLLs which are loaded inside the WinDebug and provide further functionality. One of the most important extensions you should be familiar with is the SOS extension. This extension allows specific API, and specifically debugging .NET application. It's familiar with .NET data structures, so it will be able to show you managed call stacks, it will be able to show you managed type information, it will be able to show you stuff about GC. The important thing that you need to remember about this extension, though, is that its version must be the same as the CLR. Normally, you should be able to find it online, but if not, you can always get it from production because it's actually distributed along with the CLR. There are other useful extensions out there, as we'll see in a moment. For example, the SOSX extension, which uh, provides further functionality on top of the SOS. Uh, for example, finding deadlocks easily. Uh, and it also provides a great performance boost over the APIs that already exist in SOS. There's also the NetX extension, which is specifically good for debugging HTTP and WCF uh, scenarios. Let's see, however, how we can use SOSAX to find the deadlock that we saw before. So I'm going to open WinDebug. This time I'm going to open the 64-bit. Oh, it's not running, sorry. Uh, opening WinDebug, this time it's the 64-bit version because the bitness of the debugger must match the bitness of the process that we are debugging. And I'm going to load the 64-bit version of SOSX, which is saved on my disk. I got it online. And after it's loaded, a simple call to DLK, and a few seconds later, we can see our deadlock. We can see the two threads which are locked. We can see the objects that these threads are waiting for. And obviously, again, with this knowledge, we can go back to the code and solve the problem. Now, I know that this case was really easy. It's just two threads. And obviously, we could manually do the same thing by looking at all of the threads' call stacks and analyzing what they're waiting for, what they're monitoring. However, imagine we had like 200 threads, 50 locks. I mean, God knows how long it would take us to do it manually. So it's both much easier and faster. And in fact, this is already one step towards automation. 
Finally, we get to Linux. We're going to get to analyze some of the dumps that we saw before. What we're going to do on Linux is use LLDB. LLDB is a debugger, kind of like WinDebug, but on Linux. Um, and so we're going to use that to analyze our dumps. Now, the one thing I need to mention about LLDB, um, and we're going to use that fact in a moment, is that it integrates quite well with Python. And the reason it's important for us is that LLDB requires that we tell it specifically, explicitly, the path of the SOS and the path of the CLR. And so, Using Python is actually um, a little easier for me to find the paths of these files. So once I find these files, I can then pass them to the debugger using this API, which knows how to integrate Python with it. So I'll start the debugger now. I'll pass it the executable of which the dump is, that's .NET. I'll pass it the dump that I want to analyze. In this case, it's a memory leak, it's a dump I created earlier. And I'm going to tell it, please, when you start, run this Python script, which sets all the paths, as you saw. And now that it's running, I can actually call all the regular SOS commands that I'm familiar with from Windows. For example, dump heap minus stat, which provides statistics about types which are allocated in our managed application. In this case, we can see that most of the space is taken by byte arrays. So I'd like to understand why these byte arrays are still in memory. So I'll ask the debugger to give me just like the really large byte arrays. There's nine of them. And now I will ask it to tell me how come one of these arrays is not freed from memory. What's holding it from being garbage collected? So I will use the GC root command. And here we can see all the uh, object references that start from some GC root and lead all the way down to my object. Specifically in this case, there's an event that's holding uh, my byte arrays, but again, with this knowledge and you know your own code, you go back, you find the problem. Good. Now that we know what it is that we want to automate, because we know how to do it manually, we can finally start automating it. There are, I think there are two main approaches to automation. The first is basically take a pre-existing tool, like one of the tools that we saw before, run it using the commands that it provides, redirect the output to a file, and then parse that file, do whatever analysis you want. The next approach, which is less hacky and uh, much more resilient to changes in the tools, is to kind of like write the debugger yourself. And this is where CLRMD comes into play. A few years ago, Microsoft released an open source library called CLRMD. This library provides all sorts of uh, debugging APIs, which were previously only available to us using special tools, which were also usually visual, which also hurts automation. Now, it gives uh, an entire object model around all the things that we might do as a debugger. That's threads, heaps, exceptions, types, whatever, whatever it is that you do with debugging. Now, specifically back then, as you remember, I was working on a system that had both 
managed and native. And so what's cool about this library is that even though it's written in .NET, it actually supports debugging both native and managed code. So that's what's pretty important. And I mean, I guess it's pretty common that you have a managed UI or something like that, but like the core process, heavy duty processing of your application is native. It can only, excuse me, it can also support both live debugging and uh, dump analysis, but we're focusing just on dumps right now. So let's start automating. The first thing we're going to automate is win debug. I have a script here. Let's look at it. Basically what it does is that it goes over the folder, and you can see I have a bunch of dumps here. So it goes over the folder and invokes CDB, which is the command line version of WinDebug. It invokes it on each of the files in the folder. It calls the analyze minus V command while redirecting the output to a log file. Let's run it. And you can see that it's running. It looks similar to what we previously saw inside WinDebug. Let's look at one of the files. Cool, so that's the console crasher from before. If I scroll down, I will see that I have an invalid operation exception and I have the call stack that caused it. Now, we won't do that now because obviously it's less interesting, but at this point, it shouldn't be hard to pick your favorite scripting language or whatever and analyze all of these files to search for the information that you're interested for. Now, it's true that here we only ran analyze minus v, which is pretty basic, but in fact, you could pass any command you want to CDB, or even better, you can pass your own WinDebug script. Now, WinDebug scripts are not in the scope of our talk, and they're definitely not user-friendly. Um, however, they provide much flexibility and they have a lot of power. And there was a talk about them at .NET Moscow in December uh, by Sasha Goldstein. It's available online. You should totally watch it if you think this is a path you want to go to. The next thing I want to show you is how to automate LLDB on Linux. And I hope it won't surprise you that we're going to use Python for that purpose, because we already see that there is a pretty good integration between them. Okay, so I have my Linux machine here, and first I'm actually going to run the script, and then I'll show you how it works. So, let's do it like that. Okay, so first I'm going to run my uh, script with a stacks argument, and I'm going to run it on my core file, which is a crash dump. So I ran it, that was pretty quick, I'm impressed. Um, I can scroll up, you can see that these are called stacks, and here we have it. There's an invalid operation exception, this is the call stack, uh, which caused it. Let's run a different option of my tool. This time, I'm going to run it with a memory flag, and I'm going to pass it the dump of the memory leak. So I run it, and what I get is the top 10 most memory consuming objects in my application. Let's now see how this script works. Okay, so 
This is a helper function. I won't get into details, it doesn't matter, but what it does is that it sends a command to the debugger and writes the output to a file. So that's the first automation approach we were talking about. Um, then, whoops. Then we have all the stuff about getting the arguments from the command line, that's just Python. Then we have, again, and we're already familiar with this, we get the .NET location, the SOS location, the CLR exception, all of these are going to be provided to the debugger. So, now, we create the debugger, we provide it with the executable that we're debugging, we load the dump file, and then we can start doing stuff. So let's actually start with the memory option. Oh, I forgot. Just like before, as I said, we set the locations of the SOS, the CLR, and so on. And let's actually start with the memory option. As we already remember, LLDB works with SOS. So if I want to get type statistics, I just need to run SOS dump him minus stat. So I pass it to my helper function, which runs the command and redirects the output to a file. And once I have that, I mean, I won't even go over the, the code, it doesn't matter. I just parse the file, and in this specific case, what I want to do is to take the top 10 results and display the memory in megabytes. So that's very fancy processing. Um, so that was the memory option. Now let's look how we can get stacks, call stacks for our threads. So basically here what we do is, it's like we kind of imagine that we're inside the debugger command line and we write our commands but like instead of actually writing them inside the command line debugger, we simply pass them to the debugger uh, API, which supports getting commands from my Python script. So for each of the threads in my application, I will need to tell the debugger, hey debugger, this is the thread that I'm currently working with. And then, hey debugger, please print the uh, managed exception that is currently on the stack. If there is none, then nothing is going to happen. And also, please print for me the managed call stack. And this is exactly the output that we saw before. Now, just a final note, in case you're wondering what this is and what's the function that I skipped over before, this is a tiny technical uh, obstacle. The threads have indexes inside the debugger and they have their OS IDs, and I need to somehow correlate between them. So this function does just that. You can take a look at it later. Cool. And finally, and I think this is really the holy grail of our talk, that's CLRMD. Unfortunately, currently it only works for Windows, but who knows what's going to happen next. Um, and this is actually the, the tool that I used back then to do all the analysis. So let's see what we can do, what we can achieve with CLRMD. As before, I'm going to first show you what it does, and then we'll look at the code. So I have this uh, dump analyzer project here. Let's run it. Similarly to what we did with WinDebug, it's going over all of the dumps in this folder, and it's going to display their call stacks. So this is an application called Battery Meter. It had a native exception, and you see a highlighted line here. It's highlighted because I actually have a configuration file specifying if there are certain modules which interest me. So Battery Meter is one of them, and so it's highlighted. 
Here is another DOM. It's of the same application. It's crashed in the same, in the same place. And here is a dump of our console crasher. This time it's not highlighted because the configuration file didn't specify it. And another dump from the same place. And the file explorer, which we already saw before as well. And another one. And another one. And finally, it even prints a nice summary table which tells me how many exceptions I had in each module. Now, notice, it took a minute and five seconds to analyze uh, what it is, seven dumps, right? And like, it wasn't all automatic because I had to click enter in between so that I can show you what's going on. And I don't think there's any way I could have manually opened WinDebug or Visual, not to talk about Visual Studio, which takes an hour to open, um, load uh, debug, uh, the dump file, call analyze minus V, whatever, all of that seven times in one minute, not, not gonna happen. So let's see how it works. The idea is actually quite similar to what we did with LLDB. And what we can see here is that it's part of the data structures that CLRMD provides us. It has a class for the CLR runtime and it has a class for the data target that we are debugging. And so we can load our crash dump and we can provide the uh, CLRMD library with the symbol path, which is important because if we want to be able to debug native stuff, we must provide symbols. We can check the architecture of our dump, of the application that crashed. We can verify that it suits our uh, debugger's uh, architecture. Let's now jump straight to the interesting part, and that's gating the call stacks. So we're going to start with the managed call stacks. That's down here. And I'll just make it a bit larger. This function is about, I don't know, what, like 10 lines long, but the important part of this function is exactly a line and a half. That's this part, okay? So our runtime has a treads property, and the CLR thread has a stack trace property. So if I need to get the managed call stack for a certain trade ID, I just look at all the threads, find the one with my ID, and get its stack trace. And each of these stack frames have the method, the instruction pointer, the stack pointer, and the method has a name and a type and basically everything you need to do. And this part here, that's just me transforming the CLRMD APIs and data structures into my own because I have more logic in my application and I also handle native call stacks. So I need the data structures to be aligned. So a line and a half and you have managed call stacks. Let's look at the native case. It's longer and it might look more complicated, but essentially it's very uh, similar. Now the reason this is longer and looks more complicated is that unlike the very elegant and convenient and nice APIs that CLRMD provides for all of the managed stuff, when you want to deal with native data, you're gonna end up dealing with some ugly com interfaces like debug control, debug symbols three, um, debug system objects. Um, obviously no one normal remembers where everything is located, uh, so we'll skip that. You should you know, search for whatever is needed online. But let's look at the gist of it. So this is very similar to what we did in LLDB. We just pass commands to the debugger as if we were doing them inside the command line uh, version. So I tell the debugger 
this is the thread that I'm about to analyze. Oh, excuse me. Please tell me the thread ID that I want, and please set this as the current thread that I'm about to analyze. And once I have that, well, all is left to do is to call the get stack trace. So again, the structures are less pretty, but they're essentially the same. We get a list of uh, stack frames, and we simply need to convert them into our own data structure. So let's just look at one example. Since we need to transform the instruction into an actual name of the function, and this is a native function, we'll need to use the symbols. So we use the symbols, uh, com API, to get the name by offset. We pass in all the data, and we get the name out of it. And again, we continue parsing the name, whatever, and eventually we have the exact same data that we got in the managed part. Now, I will mention, though, just a tiny comment that after we have the native stack and the managed stack, we need to kind of squish them together because like our threads might actually switch from managed to native depending on what we do. And so I have a function here. I won't go over it in detail, but what it does is that it gets for a certain thread ID, the native stack and the managed stack. And then it goes over both stacks and interleaves it together using the instruction pointer. Because we never, in the native stack, we encounter an instruction pointer which actually belongs to the managed stack. We can now add more concrete data. We know the actual managed function name. We can just squish inside our stack data structure. So that was our last demo for today. And now that you know how to analyze and get dumps and automate it and whatever, what can you do with all of this information? Well, for example, you might do what we did with it four years ago in that project I was telling you about. We actually managed to set up a system which automatically triaged crash dumps and even opened bug reports for the specific uh, developer. How did it work? Well, not exactly the same as this image depicts, because in fact, our production system wasn't easily connected to the internet. However, we did manage to move all of the crash dumps semi-manually over to the development environment. And then with a click of a button, we had a system which would go over all of these dump files, analyze them, get the exceptions and the call stacks, and we even provided it a configuration file which, uh, which specified which team or even person is responsible for each module or even function. And then, using the REST API for Redmine, which was our bug tracker back then, we even opened the defect for the relevant team or person. Now, this was a huge time saver, because until then, what would happen is that each morning, I'd get a list of dump files, and I'd need to manually open them in WinDebug, get the call stack, figure out who's responsible, open a bug uh, report, and this was a really a huge time saver. Um, what we didn't do, but really should have, was aggregate all of the dumps by exception or a call stack. Because obviously, once we got the bug buggy version out, the same crashes tended to happen over and over again. So that could have been a really great improvement, but even just the automation was a huge time saver. Before we finish, I just want to give you some more pointers about things that might interest you uh, in automation. So first of all, there's the MSOS uh, project. 
MSOS is an open source command line tool uh, which uses CLRMD to analyze both dumps and live processes. And since it's implemented in CLRMD, you can use it as a great source of, exam of example code uh, to see how things are done using CLRMD. Or you can just wrap it in your own scripts and do whatever. The next thing that you might want to explore is the concept of dump analysis as a service. Uh, there is such an open source project called Superdump. It provides pretty basic analysis, a little similar to what you get in debug Diag. There's another uh, uh, um, project, sorry, um, in, the same, uh, in the same area. It's a commercial project. It's called Dr. Dump. It's currently under development, and it's going to provide a much more sophisticated analysis of your dumps. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a website I can point you to, but you can just simply directly talk to Sasha Goldstein, who is responsible for this uh, project. So, that's it for today. What we did talk about today, and what are the main takeaways that I want you to have from this talk? Well, first of all, I hope I convinced you that logs are not enough. If we want to be able to solve our problems and know exactly what happened, we need to take dump files of our problems. And once we have these dump files, we absolutely must analyze their processing. Processing a large amount of dump files is something developers don't like doing so much. It's error prone, it's boring, and really, there is no reason to do that manually. Because as we saw, there are tools and APIs out there that can help you automate all that stuff. Now, it's true. If you have a very complicated scenario, obviously, a human being is going to have to take a look at the dump and analyze what's going on. But at the very least, the triage process can happen automatically. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you learned some new stuff, and I hope you enjoy the rest of that next. <laughs>